Hello, welcome back to Drag Queen Storybook Time. I'm your hostess, Chastity Beltoff. Today we will be reading The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum with illustrations by W.W. Denso, chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9, The Queen of Field Mice. We cannot be far from the yellow brick road now, remarked the scarecrow, as he stood beside the girl. We have come nearly as far as the river carried us away. The tin woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl, and turning his head, which worked beautifully on hinges, toward, he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass towards them. It was indeed a great yellow wild cat. The woodman thought it must be chasing something, for its ears were lying close to its head, and its mouth was wide open, showing two rows of ugly teeth, while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer, the tin woodsman saw that running before the beast was a little gray field mouse, and although he had no heart, he knew it was wrong for the wild cat to kill such a pretty harmless creature. So the woodman raised his axe, and as the wild cat ran by, he gave it a quick blow that cut the beast's head clean off from its body, and it rolled over at its feet in two pieces. The field mouse, now that it was freed from its enemy, stopped short, and coming slowly up to the woodman, it said in a squeaky little voice, and thank you. Thank you ever so much for saving my life. Don't speak of it, I beg of you, replied the woodman. I have no heart, you know, so I'm careful to help all those who may need a friend, even if it happens to be only a mouse. Only a mouse, cried the little animal indignantly. Why, I am the queen, the queen of all the field mice. Oh, indeed, said the woodman, making a bow. Therefore, you have done a great deed as well as a brave one in saving my life, added the queen. At that moment, several mice were seen running up as fast as their little legs could carry them. And when they saw their queen, they exclaimed, Oh, your majesty, we thought you would be killed. How did you manage to escape the great wildcat? And they all bowed so low to the little queen, they almost stood upon their heads. This funny tin man, she answered, killed the wildcat and saved my life. So hereafter, you must all serve him and obey his slightest wish. We will, cried all the mice in a shrill chorus. And then they scampered in all directions, for Toto had awakened from his sleep. And seeing all these mice around him, he gave one bark of delight and jumped right into the middle of the group. Toto, Toto had always loved to chase mice when he lived in Kansas, and he saw no harm in it. But the tin woodman caught the dog in his arms and held him tight. While he called to the mice, Come back, come back. Toto shall not hurt you. At this, the queen of the mice stuck her head out from a clump of grass and asked in a timid voice, Are you sure he will not bite us? I will not let him, said the woodman, so do not be afraid. One by one, the mice came creeping back, and Toto did not bark again, although he tried to get out of the woodman's arms, and would have bitten him had he not, had he not known very well he was made of tin. Finally, one of the biggest mice spoke. Is there anything we can do, it asked, to repay you for saving the life of our queen? Nothing that I know of, answered the woodman. But the scarecrow, who had been trying to think, but could not because his head was stuffed with straw, said quickly, Oh yes, you can save our friend the cowardly lion, who is asleep in the poppy bed. A lion? cried the little queen. Why, he would eat us all up. Oh no, declared the scarecrow. This lion is a coward. Really? asked the mouse. He says so himself, answered the scarecrow, and he would never hurt anyone who is our friend. If you will help us to save him, I promise that he shall treat you all with kindness. Very well, said the queen. We will trust you, but what shall we do? Are there many of these mice which call you queen and are willing to obey you? Oh, yes. There are thousands, she replied. Then send for them all to come here as soon as possible, and let each one bring a long piece of string. The queen turned to the mice that attended her and told them to go at once and get all her people. As soon as they heard her orders, they ran away in every direction as fast as possible. Now, said the scarecrow to the tin woodman, you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion. So the woodman went at once to the trees and began to work. He soon made a truck out of the limbs of trees, from which he chopped away all the leaves and branches. He fastened it together with wooden pegs and made the four wheels out of short pieces of a big tree trunk. So fast and so well did he work that by the time the mice began to arrive, the truck was all ready for them. They came from all directions, and there were thousands of them, big mice and little mice, and middle-sized mice, and each one brought a piece of string in his mouth. It was about this time that Dorothy woke from her long sleep and opened her eyes. She was greatly astounded to find herself lying among the grass with thousands of mice standing around and looking at her timidly. But the scarecrow told her about everything, 
and turning, turning to the dignified little mouse, he said, permit me to introduce you to Her Majesty, the Queen. Dorothy nodded gravely, and the Queen made a courtesy to which she became quite friendly with the little girl. The scarecrow and the woodman now began to fasten the mice to the truck using the strings they had bought. One end of a string was tied around the neck of each mouse and the other end to the truck. Of course, the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice who were to draw it. But when all the mice had been harnessed, they were able to pull it quite easily. Even the scarecrow and the tin woodman could sit on it, and were drawn swiftly by their queer little horses to the place where the lion lay asleep. After a great deal of hard work, for the lion was heavy, they managed to get him up on the truck. Then the queen hurriedly gave her people the order to start, for she feared that the mice stayed among the poppies too long. They would also fall asleep. At first, the little creatures, many though they were, could hardly stir the heavily loaded truck, but the woodman and the scarecrow both pushed from behind, and they got along better. Soon, they rolled the lion out of the poppy bed to the green fields, where he could breathe the sweet, fresh air again, instead of the poisonous scent of the flowers. Dorothy came to meet them, and thanked the little mice warmly for saving her companion from death. She had grown so fond of the big lion she was glad he had been rescued. Then the mice were unharnessed from the truck and scampered away through the grass to their homes. The queen of the mice was the last to leave. If you ever need us again, she said, come out into the field and call. We shall hear you and come to your assistance. Goodbye. Goodbye, they all answered, and away the queen ran while Dorothy held Toto tightly, lest he should run after her and frighten her. After this, they sat down beside the lion until he should awaken, and the scarecrow brought Dorothy some fruit from a tree nearby, which she ate for her dinner. End of chapter 9. Chapter 10. The Guardian of the Gate. It was some time before the cowardly lion awakened, for he had laid him in the poppies a long while, breathing in their deadly fragrance. But when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck, he was very glad to find himself still alive. I ran as fast as I could, he said, sitting down and yawning, but the flowers were too strong for me. How did you get me out? Then they told him of the field mice, and how they had generously saved him from death. And the cowardly lion laughed and said, I have always thought myself very big and terrible, yet such small things as flowers came near to killing me, and such small animals as mice have saved my life. How strange it all is, but comrades, what shall we do now? We must journey on until we find the road of yellow brick again, said Dorothy, and then we can keep on to the Emerald City. So the lion, being fully re refreshed and feeling quite himself again, they all started upon the journey, greatly enjoying the walk through the soft, fresh grass. It was not long before they reached the road of yellow brick, turned again toward the Emerald City, where the great Oz dwelt. The road was smooth and well paved now, and the country about them was beautiful, so that the travelers rejoiced in leaving the forest far behind, and with it the many dangers they had met in its gloomy shades. Once more they could see fences built beside the road, but these were painted green when they came to a small house which a farmer evidently lived. That also was painted green. They passed by several of these houses during the afternoon, and sometimes people came to the doors and looked at them as if they would like to ask questions. But no one came near them, nor spoke to them because of the great lion, which they were much afraid. The people were all dressed in clothing of a lovely emerald green color, and wore peaked hats like those of the munchkins. This must be the land of Oz, said Dorothy, but we are surely getting near the Emerald City. Yes, answered the scarecrow. Everything is green here, while in the country of the munchkins, blue was the favorite color. But the people do not seem as to be friendly as munchkins, and I'm afraid we shall be able, unable to find a place to pass the night. I should like something to eat besides fruit, said the girl, and I'm sure Toto is nearly starved. Let us stop at the next house and talk to the people. So when they came to a good-sized farmhouse, Dorothy walked boldly up to the door and knocked. A woman opened it just far enough to look out and said, What do you want, child? Why is that great lion with you? We wish to pass the night with you, if you allow us, answered Dorothy, and the lion is my friend and comrade who would not hurt you for the world. Is he tame, asked the woman, opening the door a little wider. Oh, yes, said the girl, and he is a great coward, too, so he'd be more afraid of you than you are of him. Well, said the woman, after thinking it over and taking another peep at the lion, if that is the case, you may come in, and I will give you some supper and a place to sleep. So they all entered the house, where there were, besides the woman, two children and a man. The man had hurt his leg and was lying on the couch in a the corner. They seemed greatly surprised to see so strange a company. While the woman was busy laying the table, a man asked, where are you all going? To the Emerald City, said Dorothy, to see the great Oz. Oh, indeed, exclaimed the man. Are you sure that Oz will see you? Why not? 
she replied. Why, they said that he never lets anyone come into his presence. I have been to the Emerald City many times. It is a beautiful and wonderful place, but I have never been permitted to see the great Oz, nor do I know of any living person who has seen him. Does he never go out? asked the Scarecrow. Never. He sits day after day in the great throne room of his palace, and even those who wait upon him do not see him face to face. What is he like? asked the girl. That is hard to tell, said the man thoughtfully. You see, Oz is a great wizard and can take on any form he wishes. So that some say he looks like a bird, and some say he looks like an elephant, and some say he looks like a cat. To others he appears as a beautiful fairy or a brownie or in any other form that pleases him. But who the real Oz is, when he is in his own form, no living person can tell. That is very strange, said Dorothy. We must try in some way to see him. We shall have made our journey for nothing. Why do you wish to see the terrible Oz? asked the man. I want him to give me some brains, said the scarecrow. Oh, Oz, well, Oz could do that easily enough, declared the man. He has more brains than he needs. And I want him to give me a heart, said the tin woodman. That would not trouble him, continued the man, for Oz has a large collection of hearts of all sizes and shapes. And I want him to give me courage, said the cowardly lion. Oz keeps a great pot of courage in his throne room, said the man, which he has covered with a golden plate to keep it from running over. He will be glad to give you some. And I want him to send me back to Kansas, said Dorothy. Where is Kansas? asked the man in surprise. I don't know, replied Dorothy, sorrowfully, but it is my home, and I'm sure it's somewhere. Very likely. Well, Oz can do anything, so I suppose he will find Kansas for you. But first, you must get to see him, and that will be a hard task, for the great wizard does not like to see anyone, and he usually, and he usually has his own way. But what do you want, he continued, speaking to Toto. Toto only wagged his tail, which strange to say, he could not speak. The woman now called to them that supper was ready. So they gathered around the table, and Dorothy ate some delicious porridge, and a dish of scrambled eggs, and a plate of nice white bread, and enjoyed her meal. The lion ate some of the porridge, but he did not care for it, saying it was made from oats, and oats were, for, were food for horses, not for lions. The scarecrow and the tid woman ate nothing at all. Toto ate a little of everything, and was glad to get a good supper again. The woman now gave Dorothy a bed to sleep in, and Toto lay down beside her, while the lion guarded the door of her room so she might not be disturbed. The scarecrow and the tid woodman stood up in a corner and kept quiet all night, although, of course, they could not sleep. The next morning, as soon as the sun was up, they started on their way, and soon saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before them. That must be the Emerald City, said Dorothy. As they walked on, the green glow became brighter and brighter, and it seemed that at last they were nearing the end of their travels. Yet it was afternoon before they came to the great wall that surrounded the city. It was high and thick and of a bright green color. In front of them, and at the end of the road of yellow brick, was a great big gate, all studded with emeralds that glittered so in the sun that even the painted eyes of the scarecrow were dazzled by the brilliancy. There was a bell beside the gate, and Dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery tinkle sound within. Then the big gate swung slowly open, and they all passed through and found themselves in a high-arched room, the walls of which glistened with countless emeralds. Before them stood a little man about the same size as the munchkins. He was clothed all in green from his head to his feet, and even his skin was of a greenish tint. At his side was a large green fox. When he saw Dorothy and her companions, the man asked, What do you wish in the Emerald City? We came here to see the Great Oz, said Dorothy. The man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over. It has been many years since anyone asked, to see, asked me to see Oz, he said, shaking his head in perplexity. He is powerful and terrible. If you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the great wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. But it is not a foolish errand, nor an idle one, replied the scarecrow. It is important. We have been told that Oz is a good wizard. So he is, said the great man and he rules the Emerald City wisely and well. But to those who are not honest or approach him from curiosity, he is most terrible, and few have ever dared ask to see his face. I am the guardian of the gates, and since you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to this palace. But first, you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you do not wear spectacles, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles night and day. They are all locked on, for Oz so ordered it when the city was first built, and, and I have the only key that would unlock them. 
He opened the big box and Dorothy saw that it was filled with spectacles of every size and shape. All of them had green glasses in them. The guardian of the gates found a pair that would just fit Dorothy, put them over her eyes. There were two golden bands fastened to them that passed around the back of her head, where they were locked together by a little key that was at the end of a chain. The guardian of the, go of the gates wore around his neck. When they were on, Dorothy could not take them off, had she wished, but of course she did not want to be blinded by the glare of the Emerald City, so she said nothing. Then the green man fitted spectacles for the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion, and even on little Toto, and they were all locked fast with the key. Then the guardian of the gates put on his own glasses and told them he was ready to show them to the palace. Taking a big golden key from a peg on the wall, he opened another gate, and they all followed him through the portal into the streets of the Emerald City. End of chapter 10. Fly away, little friend. Oh, hello. I'm Chastity Belta. I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you are, make sure you like it, share it on all your social medias, and subscribe to Jensen Entertainment and Brad Howard's YouTube channels. Don't forget to hit those notification bells so you know every time we drop a new video. And like a girl on Facebook, Chastity Belta. Thank you.